Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Lee Lowry, and I'm the Executive Director of the American School Health Association. Today's webinar, Writing and Publishing Manuscripts as an Emerging Professional, is actually a sneak preview of a session that we are offering at the upcoming Annual School Health Conference in Baltimore, Maryland next month. Eta Sub Sigma Gamma, or ESG, the National Health Education Honorary, was involved in selecting this session as one of the several ESG-sponsored sessions that will be offered at the ASHA conference on Friday, October 7th. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about the American School Health Association. Also known as ASHA, we are the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health and that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 700 individuals represents school health as administrators at the local, state, and national levels, as health and education professionals in, pre, in a pre-K through 12 school setting, and as academics conducting research that informs school health professionals. We're also the proud publishers of the Journal of School Health, a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of ASHA can elect to receive a hard copy or electronic copy of the journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our weekly e-newsletter, School Health Action, as well as free continuing education hours through approved webinars like today's and through CE qualifying Josh articles. If you haven't already, please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the ASHA community. Visit us at ashaweb.org to learn more. ASHA's 2016 conference is coming soon. Again, located in Baltimore, Maryland during October 6th through the 8th, the annual School Health Conference provides attendees the opportunity to share ideas, network, and advocate with other like-minded school health professionals. Please note that online registration closes September 28th. Visit ashaweb.org and register today. We hope to see you. As I mentioned, the continuing education credit for today's webinar is free for all members. If you are a non-member and you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, we require a payment of $30. After the webinar, you can receive one Category 1 CECH for MCHES and CHES, one contact hour for continuing nursing education, or a certificate of attendance based on 70% or more participation today. Participation is measured by the amount of time the webinar remains active on your screen. We'll provide details for obtaining CE in a post-webinar email that will go out this week. Before I introduce you to our speakers today, I'd like to share a little bit about a framework that unites ASHA's very diverse membership. ASHA believes that schools have a responsibility to meet the needs of the whole child. The whole school, whole community, whole child, or WISC, model, developed jointly by the CDC and ASCD, provides a framework for the health and education sectors at the state and local level to work towards stronger alignment, integration, and collaboration. This approach puts the students in the center. The goal is to ensure that all students are safe, healthy, and supported, and challenged. This holistic and synergistic approach requires schools, students, families, and community partners to focus on improving both health and educational outcomes, and to create schools that nurture and support all students. It is a team effort and collaboration is the key to success. A multidisciplinary approach that involves school nurses, counselors, health educators, physical educators, community experts, administrators, and students can better leverage resources and expertise to address the needs of the whole child, meeting the needs of the, I'm sorry, the child child's physical, emotional, social, and academic needs. Using the knowledge and wisdom of this school health team and research, schools can develop policies and programs that support all students, keeping them safe from physical or emotional harm, and empower them to take responsibility for their own health and well-being. All of ASHA's webinars tie back to this model, and today's topic of writing and publishing manuscripts as an emerging professional is no exception as research supports all components of this framework and sustains this model. So a couple of notes before we begin. Your, mo your, excuse me, your phones will remain muted for the 60-minute duration of this webinar. 
If you have any questions, please type them in the questions box on the left-hand screen, and we will try to address them at the end of today's presentation. We're recording today's session, and we will send you links to the recording, to additional resources, including today's uh, presentation slides, and to the evaluation survey within the next couple of days. So let's get started with our session. We're pleased to have both Dr. Brittany Rosine and Dr. Kelly Wilson with us today. Dr. Brittany Rosine is an assistant professor of health promotion and education at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Rosine's research interest is to decrease HPV-related disease by conducting innovative interdisciplinary behavioral and social science research using multi-level theories and complexity science to generate novel strategies in alternative settings to increase HPV vaccination rates. Dr. Rosine's research interests include methods and psychometrics such as instrumentation development, survey research methodology, measurement and theory-based research such as theory development, theory application in research methods, theory application in intervention research. Dr. Rosine received her Doctor of Philosophy in Health Education with Advanced Research Methods Certificate from Texas A&M University in 2013. She will also be recognized this fall at our conference when she received ASHA's Emerging Professional Award. Now, Dr. Kelly Wilson. She is an Associate Professor, Health and Kinesiology at Texas University with over 40 manuscripts published in various publications, including, but not limited to, the Journal of School Health, and 110 plus presentations at international and national meetings. Dr. Wilson's research interests fall within child and adolescent health status and behaviors, teen pregnancy prevention with healthy sexuality, sexuality education training for professionals, and pregnant and parenting adolescents. Dr. Wilson received her PhD in health education in 2004 from Texas A&M University and will also be recognized this fall as ASHA's Outstanding School Health Researcher during our awards luncheon at our conference. ASHA is honored to have both Dr. Brittany Rosine and Dr. Kelly Wilson who bring tremendous research experience and knowledge to share with us today. Let's go ahead and get started. Over to you, Brittany. And we're just um, going to be switching at, oops, switching um, presenters, so if you can just bear with me for one second. All right, thank you for the introduction. As Lee stated, I am Dr. Brittany Rosine, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. Since moving to Cincinnati and starting my tenure clock, I have found that I have such a love and passion for writing and for mentoring students and other emerging professionals through the writing process. Oh, I've lost, I've lost my mouse. Um, there. Okay, sorry about that. And um, the learning objectives for this presentation include um, summarizing research-based strategies for writing clear, concise manuscripts, identifying effective strategies for collaborating with co-authors, listing the steps for submitting a manuscript for publication in the health education field, and finally, uh, we'll describe methods for addressing reviewers' comments. And I'm sure that many of you can relate to the emotion on this young boy's face when sitting down to write your dissertation or any grants or manuscripts that you may have. And some of you may have broken a pencil or two or possibly a keyboard in the writing process, but it is Kelly's and my goal that through this presentation and objectives, we provide you with strategies and tips to turn this frustration into excitement and enthusiasm for writing and we hope that by incorporating these strategies that we're providing you, you will have similar feelings that are portrayed in this image um, towards writing. So to meet our first objective, which is to summarize research-based strategies for clear writing, uh, con for clear, uh, sorry, <laughs> So to meet our first objective, uh, which is to summarize research-based strategies for writing clear, concise manuscripts, we're going to discuss um, the sequence of writing a manuscript, um, how to use writing groups, 
uh, how to develop a writing schedule and how you can increase your writing time, utilizing writing logs to help, um, to help you be more productive in your writing, how to document your writing projects, and a reading about writing. So for the first strategy, um, we're looking at the sequence of writing a manuscript. And in thinking about strategies for writing a manuscript, I felt that the sequence of which you write a manuscript can be really challenging sometimes. Um, for example, some of you might think, you know, do I start with the introduction first, then do I move to the discussion, or should I write the methods first? And usually when I'm writing a manuscript, or even when I'm working with students, I tend to have them develop the results table first before they do any writing. And then after all the tables are developed, um, I recommend writing the results section, which is going to be based off of your tables. And then you can move into the method section. This can be followed by the introduction, which should, which should be really aligned with your results um, and should be like a really nice linear progression. And then you can move into your discussion, which will center on the main three to four findings and then um, also address any implications that your findings have for theory and practice. And using these methods really helps to ensure that your manuscript is very uniform and has linear progression from beginning to end. And once you've completed each section, it's really smart and it's a really, it's a really great move to, um, to obtain feedback from your mentors and co-authors. The second strategy is to develop a writing group of your peers and colleagues. And developing a writing group can have tremendous and positive impact on your writing productivity. Depending on the mission of your writing group, you can utilize the writing group to help hold each other accountable, such as providing your goals for the week and then the following re week you can report if you've actually accomplished these goals. You can also use the writing group just to sit and write. Uh, for example, the University of Cincinnati has a writing group that is campus-wide on Friday afternoons and the whole purpose of this writing group is to meet and write. You can meet to provide feedback as well and this usually works best in groups of three to four people and everyone can bring about two pages double space of a project that they're currently working on and then the group selects one person to read their paper and provide feedback. And then this occurs for everybody in the writing, um, in the writing group. So everybody would get feedback from um, the other people in the group. Also, writing groups can be great for emotional support and communicating about different methods and strategies that have worked with other colleagues or for other colleagues when they run into any writing issues. Another strategy is to schedule your writing time. And scheduling your writing time or scheduling your writing sessions is the single best management strategy that you can adopt. Um, there's been research uh, looking at this strategy and assessing this strategy and the research states that um, the productive, productive faculty habits consistently point to scheduled and protected writing time as, an as a key element of success. So, for example, one study was conducted with about 22 of the most productive faculty in educational psychology, and they posed the question, um, if you were going to explain why you were so productive, what would you say? And among the answers that participants gave, scheduled time to write emerged as the dominant theme. So the figure on the slide is an example of my calendar. And I know that I'm most productive in the morning, and so I schedule my writing time anywhere between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. So during this specific week, I had two writing projects. The one in green that you see um, was for a literature review, and the one in purple was for a grant. And so with my writing time scheduled for these projects, I actually sat down during those times and worked on those projects at that time. And I treated that time in my calendar as I would have treated any other meeting that is in my calendar. So uh, this part of the, the webinar comes a little bit uh, interactive. So now I'm going to ask you to take a look at your calendar 
for the next week. And consider what time of day you're most productive. So like I said, I was most productive in the morning. Um, if you're more productive in the afternoon or possibly in the evening, take that into consideration. And I want you to schedule at least 15 minutes every day, so at least Monday through Friday, um, at least 15 minutes every day to, to schedule for your, for your writing schedule. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of seconds to do that. And as you're working on scheduling at least 15 minutes every day for your writing session, you may want to also consider gradually increasing your writing time. So if you're starting out with scheduling only 15 minutes on Monday, I would encourage you to try and schedule 16 minutes for Tuesday and then 17 minutes on Wednesday and so on and so on until the end of the week. And by the end of the week, you will have scheduled 20 minutes for your writing session. And if you continue with this strategy, um, then you will have doubled your writing time by the end of three weeks. So in three weeks' time, your writing sessions will be 30 minutes. And I cannot express how important it is to schedule your writing time. And I feel that this quote sums up, uh, sums up um, this writing strategy perfectly. And it is, prolific academics create writing time where none exist, and then carefully protect it from intrusion. Another effective strategy that that I like to use is writing logs. And to increase writing productivity, you should create a writing log at the beginning and ending of each writing session. And I'm sure some of you might be thinking, how does this help me? This really sounds a lot like more work to me that I have to write, I have to write down my writing time. And so um, writing, writing logs address three purposes. And the first one is um, it helps keep you on track and it keeps you accountable to yourself. So you know, when, when I say I'm going to spend one hour writing today, I have actually documented that I have, in fact, spent one hour on writing. Um, the second purpose is that it, is, it has served an important positive reinforcement at times when I don't know where my time went, especially during really busy weeks. And the third reason is it serves to hold me accountable to other people, um, such as my colleagues or students. And especially if you have anybody asking, you know, how has your writing been going? You can easily say, oh, yes, it's been going really good. Look at my writing log. Or um, if you haven't been uh, writing, it's documented there. It's like, you know what, I really haven't been doing um, as much writing as I, I should be. And, and you can see that. And if colleagues ask or students ask you, that helps you stay accountable. There's also been research uh, conducted on writing logs and some of the research um, that's been conducted found that uh, faculty who wrote without their writing logs um, were actually less productive than those who, who had a writing log. And then um, the faculty members who actually shared their writing logs with each other um, were nine times more productive than faculty who only kept a writing log but didn't actually share it um, with their colleagues. So here's an example of a writing log and honestly the format of which you keep your writing log really doesn't matter. It's whatever you're most comfortable with. So if you like to keep um, a notebook or if you like to keep um, documents on a computer, Either way is fine. It's just documenting it is what's most important. Um, but some things you want to consider is um, recording the date, the time that you began writing, the time that you stopped writing, total minutes spent writing, the writing project that you actually worked on, because a lot of us have several projects going on, so that's important to document uh, which projects you've been working on, and then what you have actually accomplished during that writing session. And so all of these components you can see are in, uh, are in the writing log that I have posted on this slide. 
also some people like to count how many pages or words that they wrote and uh, that's fine if you like to um, document your productivity that way I just find it a little bit difficult during the editing process so I, since I might be deleting words or putting words back in and redeleting them um, and so I find that just documenting how many minutes I wrote each day or at each session um, has worked best for me. Also, keeping a, a log of my writing sessions has helped provide a concrete, objective sense of time I spent writing, um, which projects I tackle each time, and what is accomplished in each section. So this strategy is helpful, helpful for capturing the decisions I made throughout the project, um, the place to write, my, to write notes to myself regarding items that I need to check, and a system for recording the development of a particular writing piece over time. And so therefore I've learned to keep a writing journal, which is a little bit different than the writing log that we just talked about. This journal is actually a Word document that I keep track of, of all these little notes for myself. So when I start a writing session, the first document I open is my writing log. So that example that I just showed you um, where I keep track of how long I wrote. Um, but then I open up my writing project journal and then I actually, um, the last thing I open up is the actual project itself. So then I go into my writing project journal and I date the entry and then I write as much or as little as I want to capture for, uh, regarding the goals for that writing session. And then at the end of my writing session, I go back and I record what I have accomplished, what I need to accomplish for the next writing session. And um, usually that can be something along the lines of, um, you know, I need to begin at the second introduction paragraph and add um, this particular data to that paragraph or make sure to add like this, part per this particular piece of literature to that paragraph. And this last note really allows me to pick up where I left off without any need to waste time or, you know, having to sit there and think like, oh, okay, like where, where did I? Where did I stop last time, or what, like, what do I need to do next? And the last strategy that I would like to present to you is um, I would encourage you to read about writing. And sometimes this can be a challenge just to determine what constitutes as good writing, but good writing is really anything that inspires us to carry out our own writing. So books that discuss the craft of writing, um, writing struggles, writing joys, any text that teaches us tricks or tips on how to be a better writer. Um, the main thing is, is if you do read about writing and you use reading as a warm-up to your writing, just make sure that your writing session doesn't turn into a reading, se uh, <laughs> a reading session. And there's a couple of books posted here that are really great resources. Um, that are really great resources to teach you either how to be a better writer or provide you with exercises um, to become a more power, powerful writer. So we just discussed strategies for increasing your individual writing productivity, but now we are going to shift our focus into providing you with strategies for effectively collaborating with co-authors. And everyone has different methods of writing and completing tasks and assignments, and if there's not a plan up front, there can be some miscommunication that leads to tension and lack of productivity within your writing group. So we're going to discuss some strategies for creating a team and then how to be productive within that team. So when developing your writing team for the manuscript, there are certain aspects that need to be considered when assigning team members as an author. So authorship credit should be based on these three criteria. So number one is substantial contributions to conception and design, um, acquisition of data, or analysis and interpretation of data. Number two is all authors should be involved in drafting the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content. And the third criteria is all authors should give their final approval of the version to be published. And again, all authors should meet these three criteria. And additionally, each author on your writing team should have participated sufficiently in the work to, to take public responsibility for appropriate portions of the content. 
So once you've thought about your writing team and you are ready to put the writing team together, you should have an open and honest discussion about authorship order before any writing begins. This conversation is really helpful to prevent any confusion, miscommunication, or hurt feelings over authorship order when the manuscript is being submitted for publication or if it's already published. So when you, when you go to have these discussions about authorship order, um, some aspects that might play into the conversation include the author's expertise, such as if they're an expert in the content area or if they're only an expert in methodology or the data analysis. You also want to discuss co-author's skill level and writing ability. And this, com this component is really important for junior faculty working with students as many students are still learning the process of writing and they're, they're working to improve their writing skills. And that means that most students need extensive revising and rewriting of their drafts and they're not, they're not often considered first authors until their writing skills and abilities have been substantially increased. And you also want to talk with your co-authors about how much time they're able to commit to the project. So if they are very busy and they're only able to provide revisions or they're only able to write one paragraph for the introduction, then they will generally not be first or second author. And last, you want to speak candidly about each co-author's responsibility and contribution to the writing project. So this means that um, you want to develop a clear guideline of what you expect from each co-author and their role and responsibility within the project, such as um, one co-author might be in charge of all the citations, formatting the tables, formatting the article for journal submission, and providing edits for the final manuscript. And this leads into assigning authorship order. And in our field, it's generally assumed that first author is responsible for a substantial amount of writing and revising. The second author is going to be responsible for a significant amount of writing, but less than the first author. And then third through last author is responsible for some writing, some of the editing, providing feedback, but definitely approving final version of the manuscript. When you have had these conversations and you finished having these conversations with your co-authors, um, it's important to document the agreed upon authorship order and responsibility and this can be completed using any method that you feel comfortable documenting these terms and examples could include an email to all co-authors, um, developing a Word document with a table detailing every uh, co-author's role and responsibility along with their authorship order. And in some cases, I know of uh, faculty members who like to use contracts with their co-authors and their students or mentees. So here's an example of a Word document with a table detailing all of, all of the co-authors um, alphabetically by last name, their authorship, along with their contribution to the project up to the date before writing started. Um, this is actually an author contribution table that I developed with some of my co-authors and we had been working on the data and doing some data analysis, um, but I developed this table after we had done the, tab uh, the data analysis, but we hadn't started writing any of the manuscript yet. And as you can see, um, as you can see here, I was the first author on this project and I had the most responsibilities in writing this manuscript. So once you have your writing team in place and you have developed responsibilities for all of your co-authors, there are specific strategies that you can use to ensure that your project stays on track and is completed within a reasonable amount of time. So one strategy that you can use is uh, standing meetings. And these meetings are set at the same time, at the same day, and it can be, you can do it weekly, you can do it bi-weekly, or you can do it monthly. And standing meetings for your writing team are such a great method to ensure that everybody is touching base consistently and moving forward um, on, on their respective sections. It can also be a great method to address any issues that arise as the manuscript is in development. So for faculty members, this can also be a great method to develop into a mentoring writing meeting with students. So for example, if you have several students working on a data set that has multiple manuscripts that are 
that are being written, your research team comes together at these standing meetings and all the team members have an opportunity to provide feedback on the, on the progress of the manuscript, um, but they're also able to receive that mentoring and that feedback from the lead faculty member. You can also develop standing writing meetings where you get with your team on a certain day at a certain time and focus just on writing for that hour. And so um, basically you can turn that into a writing meeting. And this can be really helpful if you're, if you're writing and you need immediate feedback or if you have a question for the lead author or if, um, if a co-author has a question for you. Another strategy to ensure your project is moving forward is to develop deadlines for each section of the manuscript. And you can really think of these as the smaller goals and the steps that you need to accomplish um, to accomplish that big goal. So really thinking of these are the smaller pieces to accomplish writing the entire manuscript. So breaking the manuscript into sections such as the introduction or the methods and assigning deadlines for each of these sections helps ensure the manuscript is going to keep moving forward. And also for any of the sections that a co-author is responsible for, I think it's really important to send friendly reminders for those deadlines. And my personal style, I usually like to send a, a friendly reminder a week out before the deadline. I send another friendly reminder two days before the deadline. And then I'll send one final reminder the day of the deadline. And lastly, I think it's so important to always thank your co-authors for their time and their work. It's so important to be grateful to your co-authors because they can really help you be more productive. Showing gratitude is especially important and you know, really in thinking about this presentation which is geared towards young professionals and students, most of the time your co-authors are going to be your mentors and therefore you need to thank them for their work and their mentoring, but also for their, their mentor or they're mentoring towards you in the writing process and providing those edits and feedback because providing extensive edits and feedback to increase your writing skills um, really takes a lot of time. So now I will turn the presentation over to Kelly and she's going to cover our, uh, our presentation's third and fourth objectives. All right, thank you, Brittany, for kicking us off with those first two objectives. And like she just said, I am going to continue on with objectives three and four. But since this is the first time that you're hearing from me, I also wanted to thank Asha for hosting this webinar, as I know that this is an important topic for a lot of emerging professionals. And also thank Ada Sigma Gamma and the review committee that found um, this abstract and thought that it was important to bring it not only to the ESG sponsored sessions at the American School Health Association conference, but to the ASHA membership as well. So we are going to continue talking about writing and publishing and specifically start thinking about the steps for submitting a manuscript for publication in the health education field. And one of the things that Brittany and I have decided to do is really provide you some concrete examples by using a manuscript that she and I are both co-authors on. So you will see this manuscript pop up a couple of times. And it was also published in the Journal of School Health. So we thought that it would be ideal for the membership that is on this call. And so when you're thinking about finding a journal home, one of the things that you and your co-authors want to do is to identify several journals that you would identify as homes for your manuscript. And this is something that is usually completed before the writing process begins, so that way you can ensure your formatting is appropriate during the writing process. One example here is making sure your citation style is correct. So with Journal of School Health, we use AMA citation style. So some of the tips for identifying possible journal homes is for you to become familiar with the top journals in your field. 
And the, the best way to become familiar with these is to read many articles in health education and take the ones that are most applicable to the articles that you are interested in publishing and make sure that you're reading those. You can also consult with your senior colleagues or your mentors. And for those of you who are in the academic setting, um, you may be able to consult with an academic librarian. The next thing that we recommend that you do when you're finding a journal home is to uh, explore the aims and scopes of the journals. So for example, Journal of School Health, is, their aims and scope is to address practice, theory, and research related to the health and well-being of school-aged youth. The journal is top-tiered resource for professionals who work toward providing students with programs, services, and the environments they need for good health and academic success. So if you were writing a manuscript that had to do with the WISC model that Lee introduced at the beginning of this webinar, that would be an ideal manuscript for the aims and scope of the Journal of School Health. However, if you were working with a college age population, this may not be the ideal journal home and you may need to go find another journal that you identify as, um, as the ideal place for submitting your article for peer review. Another item to consider is the readership. So is your article focused on or would the people reading your article be administrators, counselors, dentists, health educators, physical educators, school nurses, or school physicians? Then Journal of School Health may be the home. However, if your readership was somewhere other than this, once again, you may want to explore other journals um, as the venue for submitting your manuscript. Another important discussion to have with your co-authors is the discussion about impact factor. On the slide that you have in front of you, you can see that I pulled a screenshot from the Journal of School Health website, and the current impact factor is 1.57 for Journal of School Health. The impact factor of an academic journal is a measure reflecting the yearly average number of citations to recent articles published in that journal. It's frequently used as a proxy for the relative importance of a journal within its field, with journals with higher impact factors deemed to be more important than those with lower ones. Now, some will argue that impact factor should not be a sole measure in the quality of journals, so the writing team needs to discuss its importance to the manuscripts versus other factors. For example, readership. You may be trying to get your manuscript out to a certain readership, and that, that those readers may be reading a journal that has a lower impact factor. So working from an example, one thing to think about is um, the manuscript that we will be using as the example through the rest of this presentation is one with school nurses. And so the target audience could be the readership from the Journal of School Health, or the readership could also be in the Journal of School Nursing. The impact factor for Journal of School Health is 1.547, and the Journal of School Nursing impact factor is 0.932. So we as a team had to sit down together and figure out what was the best journal home for this particular manuscript. We identified it as Journal of School Health, and luckily it went to print. Also on the slide in front of you, you will find a table um, similar to some of the tables that Brittany has already shown as examples. And so you can use um, this kind of table to log the different ideas of potential journal homes because those of us who have gone through the publishing process recognize that an editor or peer reviewers may find our manuscripts as not a good fit for the journal, and you may have to go to another journal home. So a table such as the one in front of you will help to log some of those aims and scopes and some of the other items that you and your co-authors considered in finding the journal home.
one of the tips that we wanted to provide you is to let you know that there are some tools on how to find good journals to publish in. So we recommended that you look at the aims and scope for a journal. One other thing to look at is the table of contents. If you are still uh, unsure of a good journal home, there are also electronic journal finders that you can copy and paste items such as your title, your abstract, or your keywords into these electronic finders and the finder will tell you compatible journals or journals that might be good homes for your particular manuscript. I do want to recognize that there are some limitations to these journal finder, finders. For example, some of them can have a fee. Right now, if you click on any of these, none of the ones that are provided as example journal finders have a fee at this point, but there is a note that a fee could be incurred at some point. Some of them also uh, link to only particular journals. So for example, Elsevier Journal Finder only links to Elsevier journals. And then Jane, which is the third bullet, the Journal Article Name Estimator, only finds journals in the Biomedical Sciences journals. So this is just a good tool that you can use your resources that you already have in your title, your abstract, and your keywords to find a good home. And we have an example, once again, using this particular article, the school nurse's knowledge, attitudes, perceptions of roles as opinion leader, and professional practice regarding human papillomavirus vaccine for youth. As you can see, this Brittany is first author on this manuscript, and it is published in the Journal of School Health. When I put the abstract and the title for this research article, not surprising, Jane actually identified the Journal of School Health as the best home. It showed up the highest confidence interval for this particular manuscript. If we hadn't already found a home as authors, then we could also look at some of these others, such as the Journal of School Nursing, Vaccine, or BMC Public Health as potential journals to uh, submit this manuscript to. The next item for considering um, the steps for submitting a manuscript for publication is to think about the article format. So when you decide the journal home, one of the things that you will need to do as a co-author is to explore the author guidelines for that particular journal. The author guidelines should have a set article format that you can follow. The article format that you see on the screen in front of you, abstract, background, methods, results, discussion, implications of findings for school health, human subjects approval statement, acknowledgments, and references is the article format for a research article that would be submitted to the Journal of School Health. All right, so continuing on with preparing to submit for publication. So I just jumped ahead from that previous slide, assuming um, that my co-authors and I move forward. We access the article format that is required by the journal. We followed that format and made sure we addressed all of those headings and any requirements for the authors. And now we're preparing to submit for publication. So some of the things that you need to prepare is a cover letter, a title page, a ma the manuscript, and tables and figures. And so typically you will find um, an online electronic submission process for submitting these. I do want to note that sometimes you may find that a journal may have you submit your documents to an email address that goes to the editor in most cases. 
Um, this is not typical format, but it does happen in some cases. Um, for example, a special issue may be, um, there may be a call for a issue, and the editor, the guest editor of that special issue wants to receive the manuscripts through email. So, back to preparing to submit for publication. I already mentioned the cover letter. Um, and we are going to talk about a few things to include in the cover letter. And we will also look at examples of a title page. All right, so continuing on um, before, we, before we look at the cover letter, uh, we already mentioned looking at journal instructions and formatting. So one thing to consider is what is your category for your article? In the Journal of School Health, there are a couple of different categories, such as general article, research article, commentaries, school health policy, and health services applications. So as an author, you would need to make sure that you are submitting underneath the appropriate category. Some other things to consider with your manuscript um, is your word count. The most author guidelines will either give you a range of word count or a maximum word count, and you need to make sure that, that you are adhering to that word count. Um, it comes very important to the editorial board and the number of pages that a particular journal actually publishes. Um, AAPA or AMA citation style is the traditional format for health education. And your citation style also guides the table and figures and the formatting for that. And another thing that is becoming very common in publications is making sure that you have an IRB human subjects approval statement. And most journals will give you examples of those. So here is a brief glance at a cover letter. We recognize that you won't be able to read all of these words. But we are going to be highlighting a few key components um, of this cover, cover letter. So the first one is basically the authors and the manuscript title, so the editor knows what he or she is looking at. Um, also, what is the purpose of this article or manuscript? going on to the roles the authors have taken and also guaranteeing to the author that this article is not under review um, by any other journal. So that is one um, professional rule that we want to follow is that you are not submitting the same article to two different journal venues. All right. And most journals will give you um, some examples of different things that are required on the title page. And here's an example of the title page that was submitted um, to the Journal of School Health. And so this includes the author with the identified order. It also identified Brittany as the corresponding author. That is what is in parentheses next to her name. You also include degrees title, institutional affiliations, address, phone number, and email address using the format. I wanted to mention this because one of the things that you don't want to do when you are getting to a time crunch for submitting the manuscript is go in, log into the system, and not be able to, and not have that information with you, and then you spend um, 20 minutes compiling everybody's, um, everybody's information. So the submission process, as I said, is normally um, done electronically. And so one of the things that you will do is log in as a registered user. If you are signing into a new journal, then you may have to go through a registration process. And so this is just getting your author information, your credentials, your institution or organization that you work with, and it allows you to set up your login process. And then from there, you follow instructions for manuscript submission. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know that you have followed all of the instructions and you have met the requirements for manuscript submission by approving a final PDF. So I just uh, pulled a screenshot from um, the Journal of School Health uh, portal through the Wiley publisher. 
And this is what ours looked like once it was accepted. So it does give you creation dates and submission dates. Here we have a nice little process or a nice little chart that shows the submission process. You will note that after you submit, we hope for the column of cells that actually fall on the left side of your screen. Um, so that is accept. Everybody's very excited and does hallway celebrations when they get the accept email. Um, from an editor. And so at that point, you are then waiting for proofs to come from the um, editorial management team. Okay, we also have the case where you may get an immediate reject. Um, don't feel down if you get an immediate reject. What you want to do is review the comments that you receive back from the peer reviewers and consider those comments and revise um, that manuscript to address those concerns from the peer reviewers and then find a new journal home. So that is actually going back to one of those table resources that we mentioned earlier in the presentation. And so now I am going to focus on the middle column, which is revise and resubmit. And some of the things that you need to do is review the comments and then also develop a, a comments to reviewers. Uh, Journal of School Health actually has a table that we have an example of that you actually document in the table um, the, your comments as an author to the reviewers. And then you move forward with making appropriate revisions to the manuscript and you submit the revisions um, to the editors and the reviewers. Okay. And my screen is showing that this table jumped up, so I apologize um, that if the table is out of, um, out of sync on your screen. But this is really focusing on the revise and resubmit um, comments and making comments to the reviewers. So as I mentioned, when you publish with the Journal of School Health or when you submit a manuscript to the Journal of School Health, if you have um, a revise and resubmit process that you're following, the editor will actually ask you to use a table very similar to this that includes the original reviewer. It includes, you will add the reviewer comments, and then you will add the author's response to those particular comments um, and what corrections you made in the column next to that, and then the location of um, the corrective. So basically what page number and what line is that on. And what we want you to keep in mind is that the review and comments is an ongoing conversation between you and the reviewers. If the revision is not appropriate for the study or you not appropriate for the theoretical framework you used or there, there may be other instances uh, where you as an author are not comfortable making a change, you can explain to the reviewers why that change is not possible. But you want to make sure that you address all comments and make appropriate revisions. And then the resubmission process is to log in as the registered user and follow instructions um, for resubmitting the manuscript. Um, so we are being open and clear that um, that you are on a, that we had a minor revision to the school nurses knowledge, attitudes, perceptions of role as opinion leader and professional practice regarding HPV vaccine for youth. And here's an example of the screenshot that you see when you are resubmitting your manuscript. And then we are assuming that your resubmission is going to be accepted, um, which once again, if you get an immediate accept, we celebrate. When you get the accept on your revisions, we celebrate. And make sure that you celebrate with your co-authors um, and give each other high fives and kudos um, for the process that you have gone through with sharing your information and your research um, with the larger profession. And then you are waiting for page proofs. You will get email notifications um, with Journal of School Health through the Wiley Publishing um, portal. 
and they will send you things. Here I have a little green um, circle that indicates that you um, have a query to respond to. You could also um, be asked to verify your authors, and then you could also be asked to make any additional revisions, um, revisions that you have as an authorship team, or respond to questions that the editors may have. But one thing to note is that once you have proofs in hand or in your box, the editors may request for you to move quickly. And then once you move quickly, your manuscript is in print. Once again, another celebration. Um, so at this point, this is when you can share this manuscript with other people um, and really celebrate. One of the things that um, my co-authors like to do is to make sure that we are um, updating our CV line and actually changing um, our CV line or our resume line to read that our manuscript is no longer in press, but it is actually now in print. So that right, wraps up the methods that we recommend using for addressing the reviewer's comments. And Brittany and I wanted to take a moment to identify some of the resources that we use for our writing process with, between ourselves and also with other teams that we write with. But we also wanted to give everybody um, some resources that, so that you could read about the writing process. Um, so we have Dr. Goodson's book, Becoming an Academic Writer, another book by um, Lori Belcher, Writing Your Journal Article in 12 Weeks and then how to write a lot. So these are feasible reads that you can utilize um, to help advance your writing process. So on the slide you have our contact information, but we also have about five minutes left for any questions that you have for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Um, this is Lee Lowry again, and I do want to encourage folks to go ahead and, and submit questions. I do have one that I can um, start the Q&A session with, but that's all I've got. So um, feel free to submit some more. We have just a few minutes and we might be able to get to it. Um, okay, so the first question that we have is, as an author, what is your opinion on submitting to an open access journal or not? I'll let um, you both speak to that. Who wants to take it first? Um, Kelly, I think you might probably have more experience in submitting to open access journals. Um, mm -hmm. So, so if you I, want to... I will um, actually defer to some of the um, strategies that we used for identifying journal homes and really taking into um, careful consideration what an open access journal may look like on your CV. So what was the purpose of submitting to an open access? Was it to increase the readership? Then it might be an ideal, um, an ideal home. One thing to think about is um, some, the other thing to consider is whether the open access is still peer reviewed or not. Um, there definitely are critiques of open access journals being a way of paying for your manuscript to be published. So just putting money on the table and a guarantee that it's going to be published. But some open access journals still go through a peer review process, even though there may be a fee associated with it. And considering uh, some of the steps that the open access journals take to increase quality. So I would go back to um, exploring the aims and scopes of that open access journal. What is your purpose as an author for publishing in an open access journal? Can you afford to publish it? And will it be viewed as you just paid money to submit this manuscript and get it published? Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, okay, so one more question. Um, do you have any best practices to share for submitting to international journals? I'll go ahead and start, Brittany, if you want to follow up. Um, I, the best practices are still the steps that we provided, um, except for recognizing that the readership may be different. 
I know one of the things that I have experienced when I um, submitted to a health education journal that was internationally based was making sure that I was using the appropriate language. Um, so behavior wasn't spelt as we spell it in the U.S., but with a U included in that. So the steps would still be the same, um, but you really need to take into consideration what are the aims and scopes what is the readership? And does this change the style of your writing at all? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And that's all that we have time for today. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Uh, Brittany Rosine and to Dr. Kelly Wilson for presenting today's session. And thank you to Ada Sigma Gamma for um, sponsoring this session both at our conference and um, here today on our webinar. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we have recorded today's session. We are going to be following up with an email at some point later this week. Um, and it will include a link to the recording. It will include the slides. I know several have asked about the slides. We will be sharing those. And we'll also include an evaluation and information for obtaining continuing education credit. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to all of you for participating, and we will be in touch by the end of the week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.